Hello, everybody, and welcome to another World of Warcraft live developer Q&A. My name is Josh Allen. I'm slightly too far to the yep. left. Uh, <laughs> what's up? We, uh, so today we got lots of questions. Of course, yep. Ian has a Hazacostas, game director of World of Warcraft, is here with us as well today. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Yeah, my pleasure. And first and foremost, I mean, new room, new yeah. backdrop. You know, people were speculating over the presence of a Jaina book in the background. Well, what could this mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. What what could this possibly mean? It could mean that uh, we're in our new studio, which I have not finished setting up yet. So, it could mean that. Uh, visuals TBD. Uh, this is still a little bit temporary, but we are in our, our nice new studio space, which is soundproofed. Uh, so hopefully you will no longer hear people opening doors nearby. That'll be fantastic. It's an exciting world in which we live. Yes. <laughs> Hooray for 2017. All right. Uh, so we got lots of questions picked out today. Um, just for everyone's awareness, uh, we're not talking about WoW Classic today. Uh, that's just because we just don't have yeah. answers for pretty yeah. much anything I mean, at this point. A lot of questions. Again, appreciate the enthusiasm. Love the discussion. It's a super fun discussion to have. We've all been really enjoying following that discussion unfold. I think, like we said, like Jay said at BlizzCon, you know, we're at the beginnings of this process. We are building a team to make this happen. We look forward to... a awesome discussion conversation with the community about what classic means to you um and you know as we have answers we'll be more than happy to to share them in a you know in a formal way um but i mean that said also kind of like jay said back at blizzcon we understand that you know when he says that some of you your favorite flavor is vanilla we know vanilla means vanilla we know that it's about community and that means some of the inconveniences that means some of the rough edges that's not something we're looking to, to move away from. It's more some of the questions like Jay raised, which version of that experience? Is it the 2005 version? Is it the 2006 version? There were a lot of changes that happened during the classic time frame, and there's a lot of fun discussions to have as we figure out what the right experience is. So more yep. to share in the future. Thank you for the passion. Keep the feedback coming. Keep the chat coming. Yep, absolutely. Uh, we do, however, lots of questions, have lots of questions that we'll be answering about uh, Patch 735 as well as uh, Battle for Azeroth. Yep, which so we... all of you who tuned in just to learn about Classic, you can, you know, you just, you, I just saved you an hour. You're not supposed to tell viewers to go away. That's not, that's not no. how we, anyway. I mean, right. There's going to be awesome World of Warcraft, Legion, and Battle for Azeroth information coming your way. Yeah. But no more Classic stuff. Yeah. Sorry. All right. Uh, so let's get into this first question. It comes from Star Swirls, who asked, uh, since tier set bonuses are going away in BFA, does this mean we're still getting 12 unique armor sets per tier, or is it one per class, or is class-based uh, tier art going away entirely? So I think going away is a strong word. I think we're taking a different approach for Battle for Azeroth. This is driven by a couple of things. Um, first off, the Azerite armor system and the way that's going to interact with the Heart of Azeroth adds a lot of depth and customization to many of the same armor slots we've traditionally used for tier sets. Also, we've looked back and seen the role of tier sets and the place of tier sets change significantly over the years. I mean, way, way back, speaking of classic, it was something that, you know, you might spend four, five, six months cobbling together your full eight-piece set, and many people never assembled it at all because you had to figure out, you know, which of the three hunters in your raid was actually going to go for their full set because there wasn't enough loot to actually get every, everyone everything they wanted. Mm. Um, those were long-term goals. Nowadays, with multiple difficulties, often we're seeing people getting their tier set bonuses within the first couple of weeks of a new tier, w whether they're going to LFR, whether they're going to down a difficulty to cobble it together, then you're kind of locked into those armor pieces. And with more sets of, more sources of loot and more parallel progression paths, anyone who's opened their Mythic Keystone Weekly Chest and looked at their character and seen like legendary, legendary, tier piece, tier piece, tier piece, tier piece, tier piece. Mm. These are just dead slots effectively. There's a whole world of items that are just gone effectively for consideration. And that's not a great place to be. So now actually getting back to the art side of the question. Um, another thing we're really excited about doing here is taking that same amount of art time, the same number of armor sets and trying to create more variety that's accessible to more players with them. So for example, in Emerald Nightmare in Legion, the armor, a lot of the armor that you saw were recolors or variants of the tier set for of the tier 19 tier set, which you eventually would obtain later on in Nighthold. A lot of those pieces, when you looked at them, felt like they had no connection whatsoever to the Emerald Nightmare. You were going into that zone, you were killing corrupted monstrosities, 
and the loot that you were getting didn't really have a direct link there. And that's kind of how, how our raid armor has always worked for years and years and years. We, we spend all of our artist time making the class sets and then just sort of use recolors and variants on mm. them to flesh out the rest of the loot tables. This time around, we want to go really heavy on the thematic origins of this armor. So, you know, when you go into Uldir, all the loot from there is going to be cloth leather mail plate sets that feel like they came from this troll titan corrupted vibe. Something very, very different in a very different direction than we've explored in the past. Then when if you move on to, you know, when we eventually go to face Queen Ashara, there's this whole sort of high elven aquatic vibe that we can capture there. And so in a world with transmog, I mean, we see today lots of people get their tier sets and instantly transmog them to whatever their favorite look is anyway. If you want that in the short term, if you want that iconic, you know, paladin look, there are literally, you know, dozens of options out there right. for you. But for Battle for Azeroth, while the mechanics of the system move away from, you know, assembling tier set bonuses and focus more on customizing your helm and your shoulders and your chest, we'd like to take that opportunity to add a lot more art variety to the world, to have heavily themed nautical maritime Kul sets and Zandalari troll sets and alliance sets and horde sets. And, you know, in terms of appearances and differentiation, there'll be more options than ever before, as opposed to, you know, our 22nd or 23rd take on priest class fantasy. Okay, sure. So kind of theming it, because we, we've had armor sets in the past that are sort of, um, like I'm thinking back to uh, like Nex Ramus in particular, mm -hmm. uh, and some of the sets in Old War. Uh, Wrath of the Lich King also had sets that were, they were still class focused, but they were kind of uh, geared towards where you were getting them from. A little, I think, at times that also muddies the waters a little bit. Like mm -hmm. we've, we've always ran into that, like how do you make a fell set for a mage? That doesn't feel like a warlock set on some sure. level, right? Or like, there's there are blurry lines there. What's the what's the old god themed paladin set? Good luck. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I think this is this isn't this isn't a reduction in the amount of art that we're doing. If anything, it's an it's an increase. But I think it's going to lead to a lot more variety that's accessible to a lot more people in the long run. And I think it's it's almost certain we're going to get back to class based stuff further on down the line. Sure. But for battle for Azeroth. <clears throat> This, you know, Alliance versus Horde, Kul Tiran versus Zandalari, etc. approach made sense to, to spread out throughout a lot of our armor art as well. Okay. Uh, and sorry, just a, another sort of follow-up question on that. Does that mean that it's it's one uh, one appearance per armor type? So like one male, one leather, one cloth, one plate? Yes, th that's the thought per, okay. for a given zone. But there'll be, there'll be more variety across different zones. There'll be more of those sets okay. than we've seen in the past. And... Okay, so just kind of, for, for Battle for Azeroth, instead of doing another, like, class-based set, we're just doing something that's, like, let's make it themed about where it's from. Exactly. Uh, and just giving giving a little bit more yeah. variety. And it's also, it's, one, it's the okay. first time we're really giving our fully high-fidelity raid armor treatment to non-class-themed sets, right? With mm. the full, like, added geometry, a lot of visual effects. Okay, yeah. More epic mythic versions, etc. So I think... For the transmog fans out there, it's really going to sort of blow out the space that you have to customize your character and the variety of epic looks you can put together. Yeah, I think I think a lot of people, uh, frankly myself included, were initially hearing like, oh, so it's going to be like all those boring non-set pieces that have been in all the previous nope. raids. But if we're like really nope. putting that same level of, okay. Yeah, I mean, again, and if, cool. if you look, if, if, if you saw the art panel at BlizzCon where they showed off Alliance and Horde themed armor sets, oh, those right. are a couple of examples yeah, of yeah. that direction. Obviously, those are faction specific. You'd be getting those through PvP, Warfronts. But imagine that approach carried through the different raid and dungeon sets, like, you know, awesome. like I said, Zandalari themed, Titan themed, yeah. Elven themed, etc. Cool. Uh, let's move on. This is one uh, talking a little bit more about the actual bonuses coming from tier sets mm -hmm. uh, from Whiskey Jack OCE, who said, uh, "Won't the removal of tier bonuses create less incentive for people to do raids? The removal slash lessening of incentives typically lowers participation rates, and there is a concern it will impact raiding guilds in the future." Uh, definitely a valid concern. I think that's space. so. Two two answers there. I think there will still be unique trinkets, things that are only available from raids that are very attractive, but also the Heart of Azeroth armor system, these are handcrafted items, and so there'll be properties that you can only find on, like, you know, the helm or shoulders mm. from the new raid tier, when that raid tier comes out, that may be exciting, that may be special for your class. It's not the raw 
sort of stat power advantage of, sorry, if you only do dungeons, you just don't get this four-piece bonus, but right. the raider does. That doesn't necessarily make as much sense either in this world of parallel progression paths, but unique things that you can only get from raiding that are gameplay effects will still exist and will still be very powerful. I think ideally, you know, the, there, there'll be things that people want from every sphere of the game. The person who's participating in a wide variety of content and doing so at a high level of skill and accomplishment will be the most rounded, most effective player, as opposed to, you know, just this one path. Okay. Yeah, I, I know as, as someone who does uh, mostly just Mythic Plus myself these days, like, I'm kind of looking at this as a, as a positive for me, but I can yeah. totally see why, why a raider would yeah, com- be worried about we it. We understand. Like, obviously, the assembling... 10 plus people let alone 20 for mythic keeping that ro- keeping that roster together maintaining a schedule progressing yeah, there's yeah, yeah. there are large social burdens there and there need to be unique rewards and incentives in order to make that feel worthwhile and properly rewarded there will be okay cool uh moving on next question comes from perculia hi perculia uh, who asked, uh, Patch 735 has a lot of content, but we mostly learned about it through scattered fragments in BlizzCon interviews. What's the TLDR on new features coming in 735? Off the top of your yep. head, go. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> TLDR, uh, scaling worlds, uh, uh, epilogue quest content that tells the post Argus post and Taurus story, Old War time walking. Down the line, there'll be a preview of our... Battlegrounds, hmm. or Silithus Battleground coming in Battle for Azeroth, um, and assorted little odds and ends, smaller changes, flavor stuff. That's that's kind of the general package. Yeah, but yeah, BlizzCon, we were obviously focused on Battle right, for Azeroth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's Wanted a lot of that to talk get about. Get some info out there, but it would have been, you know, it would have felt like a bit of a distraction to put in the main panel presentation, for example. Yeah, for sure. Like if we were at BlizzCon, hey everyone, Battle for Azeroth, now let's talk about 735. It's like, Okay, yeah, people are going to be a little bit more interested in the new expansion. And yeah, coming but obviously to, and, there's, there's stuff in 735 yeah, as and well. And coming to PTR soon, yeah, like, yeah. like quite soon. Yep. Cool. Uh, question from Gale Deep AD... Is, K, hmm, letters. <laughs> Gale Deep and some letters. AQW. Asked, yeah, thank you. <laughs> in Legion, class identity was dealt with amazingly. Are there plans to do the same for races during, for, during Battle for Azeroth? Uh, given the new focus on factions and addition of sub races, it'd be a great time to expand inside rather than out. By the way, allied yeah. races, not sub races, yes. it's a different thing. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so allied races uh, certainly <laughs> there there is a lot of focus on their backstory, how their culture, how they come in to join the alliance with the horde. That will shed a lot of light there. Um, but I think our focus this time around really is on factions, as you say, rather than the races within them. So the story in Legion was very much one of alliance and horde initially holding hands, going to the Broken Shore, working together to take down the Legion. You saw, you know, Sylvanas covering Varian's back for a little while on the gunship. Mm. And that failed horribly. And those, <laughs> that alliance splintered. The forces of Azeroth were defeated. And it was the class orders kind of forming the, like, building up and working on their own and beginning to cooperate down the line to solve this problem facing Azeroth because the Alliance of the Horde couldn't. Here... Well, if this isn't about a lot about humans and dwarves and night elves working separately. It's about them working together, and that exists, right. and that is the alliance. So I think that's the anchor here. Now, racial identity, I think, is an awesome place to explore in the future, and certainly as we ve- venture to different areas of the world. You know, if you're a troll, there's going to be a lot of really cool stuff for you in Zandalar, for example. Sure. Something you want, yeah. you want to continue to do, and there could be that really race-heavy pa- or expansion down the line, the way we did class-heavy in Legion. But I would think of Battle for Azeroth as the faction-heavy expansion. Cool. Yeah, um, that makes sense, for sure. Uh, let's just move on to the next question. comes from Kasumi. Uh, this has been a popular question. Uh, who asked, uh, could you guys elaborate on what rep standing we'll need to unlock allied races? Will players be expected to go earn Exalted with the Nightfallen in Battle for Azeroth, for example? Uh, there's no one-size-fits-all approach here. I think it's going to vary depending on the race, depending on the content. Uh, for the Nightfallen in particular, uh, I, th- I think Exalted is required, but in practice, the way the way that really more works, we re- remove the rep barriers to the different campaign steps. Right. And so it's just play through the Suramar campaign, including the insurrections, play through the story of working with Felisra to topple Elisan's regime and restore you know, the Nightfallen to their proper place in that society, and then 
in Battle for Azeroth, it, you'll be able to carry that story one step forward and bring them into the Horde formally. So it's more it's more story driven than yeah. you know grinding driven in you know in those regards. Yeah, but, without the yeah. without those rep barriers, and because it, when when Legion launched and for quite a while after that, it was. You've quested through some of this. Now you have to wait until you get like honor. You have to, to do go yeah, to the next exactly. Step. You'd have to do world quest for yeah. a few days. That's gone now. And just doing through the camp, doing the campaign will basically give you. It's it's not really possible to finish the full insurrection campaign at this point without ending up exalted. Sure. Just because of the rep that you get along the way. Okay. Um, yeah, and then down 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 the line. I mean, years from now, that that's certainly something we could, we could revisit and see. Does that? How does that feel? How does that make sense when you're in 2020 looking back at this? But for right now, it it feels appropriate. Okay. Uh, and like you said, it's not necessarily a one one size fits all approach. Exactly. Other other allied races may be different. A uh, question from S- Shadow Silver, who said, "Will we be able to race change to an allied race, level one of that race to one ten to get the transmog, and use the armor on the race change character?" So I guess kind of talking yeah. about two characters here, one of yep. which is like your main that you've race changed to an allied race that you've unlocked, but then you go and you level one of those uh, to one ten to get the transmog. Can you then use that transmog? on the other character. That's the general thinking now, that basically, okay. uh, Transmog is generally account-wide. This would be a race-restricted appearance. So once you've earned, let's say, the Dark Iron Dwarven Heritage Armor, any Dark Iron Dwarf can use that. But, okay. I mean, that's that's our current thinking. Could change, but I think that makes sense now. Okay. Similar to how, like, if you earned the challenge appearances in Mists of Pandaria on a Warlock, you can use that on any Warlock on yeah. your account. Mm-hmm. Cool. Uh, a question from Quady, who asked... Uh, are there plans to make sure that all classes on both sides of the conflict will get more race options with future allied races? So probably it, talking yeah. about uh, demon hunters and death. Well, okay, so yeah, that's p- potentially yes. Or you know, if you are, you know, an alliance player and you're you're looking to be a druid, the, the three allied races, none of those can be druids. Sure. So that, right. So I think there's there's two parts to that. Um, it's something we're mindful of. I think first and foremost, we're looking at what races are cool and make sense story-wise timeline-wise to come into the alliance and the horde and like it's a system that we can add to in the future so and then from there once we've picked the races we're looking at what 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 classes make sense for that race given their nature given their identity given their culture um but i think that's over time stuff something we're going to keep in mind to make sure that you know there are options there for people with different classes now death and and demon hunter are kind of special cases because they're both hero classes there's a mix of gameplay where they both start at a very high level and part of the nature of allied races, certainly at this point, is they start at level 20. But also storyline, timeline-wise, you know, Death Knights were raised by the Lich King. Right, yeah. Demon Hunters are explicitly ancient elves that were imprisoned in the vault yeah. of the Wardens. Specifically so, Illidari. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, like, that, um, that complicates things a bit. It's not to say it'll never happen, sure. but... Right now, the focus in Allied Races is that level 20 starting experience and that journey through the world. Okay. Uh, next question from Pashio, who asked, uh, will other hunched races, such as Dark Spear Trolls, Undead, Worgen, and to a lesser extent, Torin, get the option for an upright posture as well? So in the, in the Q&A panel at BlizzCon, yeah. uh, the question was asked... Uh, I forget exactly what the question is, but I remember Chris it's about Robinson. character customization, basically. Yeah, and Chris, Chris options. Robinson was saying that orcs will finally have the ability to yes. just stand up straight, which you go to, I thought <laughs> it was really entertaining, you go to a uh, a barber for. Yeah, because... he also, well, the barber can also do plastic surgery. Yeah, if yeah. you don't like, you know, if you want your jaw removed <laughs> on your Forsaken, he'll happily do that for you. Chiropractic. There's some sketchiness yeah. in that barber shop, but look, <laughs> just give him some gold. I mean, they are usually goblins on the Horde side, at least. Fair. I guess uh, half the time they're gnomes on the Alliance side, so... Anyway, yeah. other hunched races are they going to get an? I think they for... need to stand on like crates or something to make that work. But um, <laughs> the yes, yeah, so, so hunched races. Uh, Orc was the big one, really, because from the very early, from the very beginning, there were examples, notably Thrall, and then we've seen you know a new model for Sarfang. We could look at some examples of orcs that didn't have this posture, and canonically they were there, and it that was something that was a you know repeated frequent request. And something we, we want to deliver on as a result because it made sense totally understand the desire um for dark spear trolls for example i think that's sort of that posture that gait that sort of gangly blanky hunched look is part of the troll silhouette it's part of what they are pretty universally 
Uh, Zandalari trolls, for example, are upright. They have a different mm. different posture, a different overall demeanor about them. And so, you know, there's certainly allied race options down the line that could explore those spaces. But right now, I don't think we have an option to add posture customization to a broader variety of races. This really felt like something that made sense and was a specific thing for orc males right now. But it opens the door for many more customization options down the line, which we're really excited about. Yeah, definitely. Like, even though we, we don't necessarily have plans right now, the idea that maybe even for a future allied race that could yeah, be implemented, exactly. we could have different options like that. Yep. So that's pretty cool. A uh, question from Skullbera, who asked, will all of the Zandalari troll druid forms be based on dinosaurs or just their travel form, which was yeah. confirmed to be a raptor at BlizzCon? Uh, just the travel forms. So I think it, it's the your combat forms... They're very specifically, you know, they're a cat, they're a bear. There's a ton of things that reference and hook into that, both visuals and animations and the name and theming of a lot of your abilities. It's feline such and such, you know, right, and, yeah. and, you know, tiger, tiger roar, et cetera. That's, that's just the kid of the druid. So suddenly turning that into a raptor or some other dinosaur variant, I think, would be at odds with the rest of druid identity. The travel form thing just felt like a really cool hook for, you know, it's like, all right, there is a very close connection between the Zandalari trolls and the dinosaurs, as we're going to see as we explore that subcontinent. Yeah. So we're excited to be able to do that. Okay. Uh, moving on, next question from Agamotto, who asked, uh, what is planned for the honor prestige system in Battle for Azeroth? Uh, will we still need to grind for our honor talents or even have honor talents anymore? Um, this is something that's still under discussion, so I don't necessarily have a, a super satisfying answer right now. We're, we're still we're talking a lot about this internally. I think I can say that it's not going to be we're going to add you know thirty, forty new prestige levels and a new player coming to back who just who skipped Legion coming back to battle for the first time is going to have like fifty five prestige levels to get if they want all the rewards. That's not the system we're trying to create here. Um, we're looking at how how the feeling of progression with the honor talents played out uh in in a lot of ways in the long run once everyone's established it starts to feel like a barrier to entry where right. you just have to operate with a penalty for the first you know x hours in pvp until you fully unlocked many of the talents that are considered you know optimal or most desirable for your class or spec in arena or battlegrounds so i think we're, we're reevaluating a lot of things on that front. Um, regardless, we want to make sure that the prestige awards that are currently available will still be available in whatever form we have in the future. We'll have more information to come, basically. Okay. Cool. Looking forward to that personally quite a bit. Uh, next question comes from Thun, who asked, uh, Will artifact skins be locked to the spec they're from? I'm not a healer, but I really enjoy a lot of the resto, shields, and maces, and would like to wield them as elemental after Legion. Uh, I think current thinking is that, yes, they will be spec-restricted. So you only, you know, Resto, Mace, Scepter of Ashar, that's only usable at when you're Resto. Okay. Not when you're Elemental or Enhance. Um, it, it's, those artifacts are very, those appearances are very, very closely tied thematically yeah. to specific specs. Okay. Next question comes from Miss Shaw 1217 uh, who says, will artifact appearances earned on my current 110 Hunter be available for transmog on my new Void Elf Hunter in Battle for Azeroth? So if, you, uh, mm -hmm. if you've unlocked an artifact yeah. appearance now uh, and then you make a new character to level up to 110 for the Heritage Armor, are you going to be able to use those artifact I, I would expect that, yes. I, mean, I think they're, they're spec-restricted or class-restricted, as the case may be, but um, they're account-wide. And okay. transmog is, by its nature, that. Cool. Uh, question from XOX Pinkamina XOX. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, who said, with the announcement that legendaries will not, re legendaries yep. will not return in BFA and that the medallion will be a sort of replacement, uh, does this mean we will not see any of those glorious orange items at all? Certainly far fewer than you saw in Legion. Um, we don't, you know, I think we're open to the possibility of legendary items as they've existed in the past, where whether there's a incredibly iconic item that is associated with a certain raid boss or a certain source that feels like it should be orange as opposed to epic. It's somehow special and unique in that regard. We'll do that where it makes sense, but that's, you know, I think that's a very different thing than what we had in Legion. And nothing, as of now, we don't have any specific ones in mind. So the answer may be zero. The answer may be some small number. 
Okay. So, uh, not sure yet whether or not we should be looking forward to finding 5,000 shards of Varian to piece back together into... Probably not. <laughs> Maybe individual uh, Vol'jin ashes, though? Oh, yeah, yeah. To... Anyway. Piles of Vol'jin yeah. dust? <laughs> We're terrible people. Next question comes from Chewy, who said, uh, Can we get 10-man mythic rating, please and thank you? Uh, no plans to change the mythic raid size at this point. Uh, I think the... Managing a mythic roster is challenging. Uh, it, managing any raid size is challenging. And th th that's been a, a struggle for guilds throughout the history of World of Warcraft. I think when it comes to mythic, again, sort of to restate some of our prior reasoning here, there are two questions. First, should mythic rating be flexible size? And certainly that would be the easiest for roster management, but we feel like flex size rating is incompatible with the cutting edge tuning that mythic is is all about ultimately and despite our best efforts you know tuning for a single raid size is hard enough we've, we've seen some of our missteps there in tumas argaris um it's inevitable that there be some fights where 16 was the best and some where 20 was and some if you went higher than that where 25 was or whatever and the last thing we'd want to see is the the expectation that in a competitive group that's trying to excel the right thing to do is to sit a third of your raid for the next two weeks of progression because that's the best way to win, and a bunch of people just sit on the bench or right. anything along those lines. So if it's not flex, then it's, I think, a fixed size. And if it's a fixed size, what's the right fixed size? And th the value in 20 is that it allows for representation of a wide variety of classes. We can assume that you have most classes present and thus most tools available in those toolkits. We can split the rate up in more ways. We can handle more of the complex coordination that makes mythic encounters unique and uniquely demanding. And going down in size, I think, would limit a lot of that possibility. I think the reality is if we announce tomorrow that, okay, we're gonna do 15 player mythic rating, let's say, that would be, uh, you know, seeing that would be godsend for the group right now that's fielding 18 or 19 and having to cancel raids. But n not too long in the future, you'd see, you know, if someone has a 22 player roster today, your roster is going to shrink over time. You're not going to be able to sustain yeah. having seven people on the bench on a regular basis. People will move up, move on over time. You're not going to replace those who leave because you're still over full. Before you know it, now you're down to 17 or 18 showing up regularly. Yeah. And then all it takes is a couple of people who get busy at the same time. Someone gets sick, someone's computer breaks, and you're here with 14 people <laughs> asking, oh, could you reduce the raid size to 10? And, and that's just that it's it's a, it's a struggle, right? It's you have to constantly be recruiting, and mm. that is one of the very great challenges of running and maintaining a raid guild in World of Warcraft. And kind of touching on the earlier question about incentivizing raids, it's part of why we agree that it's very important that that effort be rewarded and that that you know seem worthwhile, both in terms of cosmetics and titles and prestige, but also power where it makes sense. Yeah. So you're basically like thinking. Thinking back, like when it went from 40 to 25 in Burning Crusade, like I, I can remember back yes. then, we were like, oh, thank. Yes, we'll, ne we'll never yeah. have raid attendance problems again. Yeah. This is going to be easy. Yeah, exactly. And then... we're, we've got way too many raiders. This is this yeah. is great. Now we've got 35 people showing up for raids. And instead of being five people short, now we're 10 people over. But then as time went on, that turned into, yeah. okay, crap. Now we're, we were, we were the, the best 24 man raiding guild on the server for quite some time. <laughs> Uh, and then it went to ten or twenty yep. man, and it was like, okay, great, now we're yeah. we're fine again. So I can I can see the the desire to not just constantly keep shrinking the raid size, uh, because before before long you end up with yep. one player mythic rating. And I think there's value in stability <laughs> and consistency. At this point, you know, it's it's been the same. We've had the same raid structure for the entirety of Warlords, the entirety of Legion, and looking ahead to Battle for Azeroth, we're planning to continue it. Mm -hmm. And people can have stable expectations around that structure and make decisions based on it. And there's value in that as well. That said, one thing, uh, we would like to explore ways of opening up cross-server mythic rating a bit earlier in the process where mm. possible. I think we're mindful of concerns around server first. We want to protect that competition on especially in smaller servers where you know, that those may take a while for those to get filled. But that may help groups that are you know, trying to find backfills, trying to you know, fill out a 20-player roster, have more options. That's something we'd love to do. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, actually, because when you think about it, 
when a raid first opens, that's usually when a raiding guild has their best attendance yeah. because it's the brand shiny new thing. But a few weeks into progression, or even like after you clear it and you're you're farming at that point, that's when people start to sort of drop yeah. off. So and they're also cool. and they're also cross server raiding groups that are doing heroic, and they maybe spend three months or so clearing through heroic, and they have Just twenty waiting. plus people. Yeah. But then they hit a a wall effectively because they can't continue on to mythic that doesn't seem right either that could be interesting uh let's move on next question from Nathiriel, who said how does the team feel about the overall difficulty for mythic tomb of sargeras uh, and will antorus be tuned similarly or does the team feel that tomb of sargeras was a bit too difficult i think the team feels that tomb of sargeras was a bit too difficult on <laughs> mythic specifically and the last third of the instance specifically um, i think mm. mistress fallen avatar and kill jaden specifically um i think heroic and normal were fine and okay. we, we talked about we've talked a lot about this in the past i think this some of this is you know it's it's challenging coming hitting a tuning point that's right on what the cutting edge are capable of that will be challenging enough to allow the best skills in the world to differentiate themselves from each other because that's our initial goal when when crafting this content um Nerfs are common. You know, nerfs will happen. I think I would expect that at some point I can almost, I don't know what they're going to be, but I can promise that a few months after Antorus comes out, there's going to be some nerfs to Agrimar or Argus the Unmaker on Mythic Difficulty. Sure. And that's to some extent how the game has been forever. Uh, hmm. but, you know, bosses tend to get nerfed a bit once the cutting edge have sort of planted their flag, staked their claims the best in the world for that next tier of guilds that's getting there later on that isn't necessarily stacking all the, cl the optimal classes for it or whatever else, but still wants to have a fun and satisfying experience. Um, so there's, there's two aspects here. There's tuning, and then there's also the feel of how mistakes are punished. And that's, that's something that's more broadly applicable that we do want to improve from the start. I think you know, having too many binary checks and instant pass-fail mechanics over the course of a fight that that can be frustrating and that can really wear on you regardless of the difficulty level regardless of where you are in the progression it always i think generally feels better where mistakes are punished in a way that's going to doom you in the long run you can only get away with so many but and, and you need to play well but you still get to feel like you're improving and experiencing the fight along the way versus everything was perfect and then one person made a mistake at the four minute 30 second mark of the fight the whole raid's instantly dead hmm did the yeah. whole raid learn anything there? Yeah, and I mean, there's room. That, yeah, again, there will, there will still be inst there will still yeah, be yeah. raid white mechanics. There's still some of that, but that's a balance we're going to be much more mindful about striking. Yeah, I remember you're giving me flashbacks to heroic Ragnaros again back in uh, back in Firelands, mm -hmm. where it was all right. We got to phase three, and that guy still doesn't know how to kite a meteor. Yep, and yep, or one person <laughs> stood one yard out of position in their in the magical triangle formation. Yeah, and your safe spot got blown up, and the fight's over. Yeah. And good luck figuring out who it was. <laughs> All right. Well, that's too painful. We're going to move on. Next question <laughs> coming from Faith, who says, uh, is Amanthul's vision going to be personal drop only or an item drop that can be assigned via master loot? So, okay. Um, this, may, this may be a controversial response. Um, and I, apologies, Actually, I, I think my answer to this is you'll see in two weeks. Hmm. Um, and part of that is I, I just want to push back a little bit against the idea that everything needs to be known and fully understood and analyzed and dissected ahead of time. I think I understand from the perspective of a raid leader, a master looter, you're trying to figure out your priority system. You're trying to figure out how that's going to work. You want to plan in advance to some extent. But right. the reality is I, I'm not sure that it's going to affect what you're doing today or tomorrow all that much, whether you know this or not. And I think there's value in preserving some some discovery. I mean, I think in an ideal world, I, I wish we had a way of making fewer things data mineable so that we'd go into a raid and encounter rewards that you didn't even know existed at times and have that moment of surprise and excitement. There are technical reasons why that's challenging, but I think there, there are places where I think we'll, we'll try to draw lines and not over explain not share everything there's you know a community that's wonderful at analyzing and dissecting and explaining how things work under the hood but sometimes you know magicians want to keep their secrets and their tricks um that said 
obviously there, there are places where advance notice is important, right? If, if some reward is going away, if something's not going away, if we're going to have a new currency, if you know, people have asked us, are you are using the same bonus roll tokens for Antorus? Yes, we are. Uh, because those are things that can affect your current planning. And we're not trying to catch people off guard or give people unpleasant experiences in that regard where you wasted some resource that you wish you hadn't once you learned something different. But here, go into Antorus, explore the zone, defeat the bosses, and when you reach the reward at the end, you'll see how it works. Okay. Yeah, I can just, like, thinking back to my raid leader days, I can imagine, like, I can imagine people being really, really worried about, okay, Amonthul's vision just dropped, and we haven't put any thought into this yeah. yet, and who do we give it to? And trying to have that conversation in the middle of the raid night rather than having it in advance. I can see why people would want to be having those conversations in advance. Yep. To be fair, if, it, if that happens and it does drop... You, by definition, you will have defeated the final boss of Antorus, so you're not facing time pressure. Oh, okay. You know, to rush on to the next boss. Fair. It'll be the end of your raid night. Fair. Okay. Uh, let's move on. Next question from Sharni786, who said, uh, "Is there going to be an increase to the Mythic Plus cap with Antorus as there is with every other raid?" Yep. I think those are systems that we see, you know, advancing in lockstep. So, as with past raids, the way this will work is when Mythic Antorus opens. So. December 5th? Whatever week past the 20th yeah. is. I want to say the 5th. Whatever, whatever, whatever that, that week yeah. is. Anyway, that week, when Mythic unlocks, um, you'll be able to get Mythic rewards from dungeons up to Mythic 15, and credit for your weekly chest will be retroactive. So basically, if you want to be optimal, do a 15 during the first week of Antorus, normal heroic. You won't get a better end-of-run reward, but your weekly cash the following week will have a higher quality item that will be comparable to Mythic and Taurus loot, and that's how it'll be for the rest of the tier. Okay, cool. And yeah, it will be, I was just checking uh, the calendar, it'll be the 5th for yep. North America, Latin America, 6th yep. uh, for Europe, 7th for, for Asia. Europe, seven for Asia. Yep, cool. Uh, next question from Cornetto, who asked, will Titan Forging still allow you to get Mythic quality gear in normal raids in Battle for Azeroth? The, uh, the ever-present yes. Titan yep. Forging question. Um, I think so. This came up with the BlizzCon Q and A. Uh, yes, we are carry, we plan to carry forward the Warforging Titan Forging system. I think, you know, while and and for you know, for the for reasons of continued progression across an entire ray group, moments of surprise and excitement. I think there is there is value there. That said, so a couple things. Um, while you can still get that lucky normal drop that is competitive with Mythic gear. The Mythic Raider is, in basically all cases, going to be better geared than the Heroic Raider or the Normal Raider. And that's what actually plays out if we look at the gear levels of players in the live game today. The person who's actually clearing Mythic Tomb of Sargeras is better geared across the board than the person who's doing Heroic, even if the Heroic player may have one or two specific pieces that are comparable or even better in those slots than the, than the Mythic Raider. That said, we do feel like Titan Forging probably happens a bit too frequently now. I think mm. the, the odds are something we're to look at there. And part of that, it, it's when we hear about guilds that feel like the right it's the right thing to do to always go back and clear old raids or to do, even with us unifying rewards like artifact power to be a single drop, regardless of what difficulty you do it on, they're still going back and doing tomb on normal, let's say, hoping for that super lucky Titan Forge. That's not, that's a problem. And that's, right. if it feels like that's what's being incentivized, that, that tells us the system is tuned in correctly. And right now, I think it can often feel like, certainly across a raid, if you're doing a full clear, you're probably very likely to see a couple of Titan Forge pieces and a couple of highly Titan Forge pieces along the way that leads to that feeling that, oh, wow, odds are actually, yeah, we are probably going to get a, a 930, 935 item yeah. if we do this heroic clear, so we should do it. That's more problematic. So uh, that's something we'll be digging into. But... The idea of upward scaling reward quality is something we are carrying forward. Yes. Okay. Have you ever considered? Um, I'm sure you have. The idea of having uh, like mythic drops able to Titan Forge to be slightly higher than, uh, or having mythic drops. Sorry, I'm saying this incorrectly. Yeah. Mythic drops drop at a level where lower tier Titan Forging doesn't surpass it. Um. So like if uh, yeah. We, if 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 a tier if if something drops nine thirty on mythic, then you can get a max of like nine twenty five sure. from Titan Forging it, elsewhere. T capping the Titan Forging, I think, 
is a suggestion that we've we've heard. I think the, the, the diminished odds as you go higher and higher effectively have that as a softer cap. Sure. But I think you know if we did that, the heroic raider, the person who's just doing heroic and is working on Avatar, they're working on Kill Jaden, a hard cap on Titan forging that stopped it from encroaching on the mythic space would actually very tightly limit the potential for further progress there mm. and what could actually happen. So I think. It, so yes, I think we've considered, but I think the space of anything can happen possibility is one that has value to it yeah. beyond, you know, and, and again, I get the psychology. I understand yeah, yeah. how you feel as a competitive arms warrior looking to warrior of any spec, looking to, you know, get those orange parses on Warcraft logs. Yeah. When you saw a tier ago, the, you know, socketed Titan Forged Raid Finder draft of souls <laughs> and part of your soul just dies. Yeah. But that person literally won the lottery, right? It's like, and that person, the rest of their gear is probably nowhere comparable to that. Yeah. And yeah. you're looking at something that, you know, was just this extreme outlier. We could we could we could put very high caps to stop that from happening, but the reality is like that's stopping the memes and stopping the Reddit posts and the Discord chat. It's not actually affecting the average player. Sure. And so yeah. it really the question is, you know, do you want us to kill memes? Um, well Moving on. I certainly don't want to kill memes. Uh next question from Sorry. B. Pritchett Jr. says, speaking of killing things, why are you killing world PvP in an expansion focused on faction wars? So we're killing world PvP. Yeah, uh, we're killing memes. Uh we've already killed Vulgin. Like five times yeah. or something. Yeah. What? Uh, how, how are we killing? We're on a great PvP? run here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we're not killing world PvP. Actually, I think we see mm. this as an exciting time for world PvP. We want to revitalize world PvP. Um, and that, and as as discussed at BlizzCon, I think there's two sides to that. That creating a, a space where players who are looking for world PvP can more reliably run into each other. Many of those players are stuck on wildly faction imbalanced realms where it's an anomaly, feels tremendously lopsided, and that doesn't happen all that much. Also, having a world where all players, regardless of their server type, can opt into a world PvP environment means that we can actually create global world PvP content in a way that we couldn't before. Mm. I think in the past, Anytime we had some cool idea for an outdoor PvP system or devoting a chunk of a zone or some set of quests or a large, a large swath of content to world PvP, we always ran into the question of, well, what does that mean on PvE servers? What does that mean for the millions of people who just don't get to do this content at all? The only right. way they could would be to pay for a server transfer and or leave their friends. And that, that tended to kill a lot of those ideas. Um, so while we want to give people who feel stuck on a PvP server the way to opt out of that gameplay if they no longer enjoy it without, again, having to leave their friends, right. we see this as, you know, really, I think World PvP has a very bright future in Battle for Azeroth. We're very excited for the potential of it, and it's something we know we need to devote more resources and effort to balancing, and, you know, it's never going to be, you know, we can't balance the three-on-one gank, but we can improve the feel of the combat so that it's not, you know, one-shotting and two-shotting, and it's not, doesn't feel broken. Yeah, there's a lot of really interesting potential there for things like, even things like uh, just balance balance tweaks here and there. Like, okay, yeah, when you're PvP flagged, then that maybe uh, activates your, thinking in Legion yeah. terms, activates your honor talents, uh, but turns off your legendary procs or something like that. Pot potentially, though, I think... I'm, I'm honestly, I mean, this is kind of off the cuff. I'm not sure we would do that because sure, you're sure, still yeah, you're still in a, the outdoor world. You're yeah. still like you could just be questing. You could just be doing PVE content while open to the possibility of getting into those conflicts. But we could make modifications to rule sets, such as, for example, what if you couldn't mount for X seconds after getting out of PVP combat mm. when you're on a PVP enabled server, such that there isn't the you know get on your flying mount and escape a second something goes wrong possibility open to you so that it, it's easier to track people down to pursue and to keep engaged things like that that we would be feel that we feel uncomfortable making as global changes to the entire world for all players right. we can do when it's an environment where you're opting into this gameplay experience and there's some structure to it and some incentive for it okay cool that's uh that's super cool 
Uh, another question here from Agamotto, who asked, uh, how will PvP server changes affect RP PvP realms? Uh, recent changes to RP server phasing seem to be misaligned with a new direction of PvP and PvE realms. So this isn't yeah. even just uh, RP PvP yeah. realms that are that are wondering about this. Yeah, All RP realms. RP realms in general. Yeah. Um, I think current thinking is so we've we've you know we recognize the very great importance of community to RP servers in particular, and that's something you know we've we've turned off the CRZ behavior and sharding by default on RP realms. Obviously, you can still manually form groups cross server, yeah, yeah. but we want to, you know, allow events. You want to allow organization and community to flourish. And looking at servers like Emerald Dream, obviously there are very active PvP communities there. So the current thinking is these are not incompatible. Um, you could be on a server, an RP server, and opt into PvP, and you would do that, and you would see other opted into PvP people from your server. Okay. And that would it would still be the default behavior of RP servers don't automatically, you know split people up or bring in people from other servers. Okay. Obviously, we we may need to reevaluate that in the long run if it turns out that on some servers... Like it's splitting people too it's, much. Or, 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 or there's, there isn't enough critical mass and actually players... You know, if, if we get to a point where people on RP servers are asking us to do this, yeah, then we'll look into it. But our default position is we don't want to split up RP communities and we don't want to mingle multiple RP communities together because that often has the same harmful effects. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. I think uh, hopefully that will they'll make a lot of people who are mm -hmm. playing on those servers happy. A uh, question from Benny521 who said, uh, since Battle for Azeroth will finally be PvP heavier, uh, will raiding capitals be more rewarded, or do you plan anything to encourage players to kill faction leaders? Um, so, well, I guess a couple things. First off, Battle for Azeroth will be an awesome expansion for PvP, but I don't think of it as a PvP expansion. I think of it as right, yeah. a, you know, the next chapter in World of Warcraft is an awesome all-around expansion that is going to have love for you know new battleground, new arenas, world PvP improvements, and more. Um, that's it. Yeah, raiding capitals uh, and th those achievements. I think it's a place we, we we were talking about. I think we don't have a great pl specific plan to discuss yet, but there's definitely something cool about the idea, especially given the broader story that we're telling here of an alliance army showing up at the gates of Orgrimmar with a bone to pick and being able to see that play out more often the way you sometimes did back in the day. Okay. Cool. Next question from Ezralis, who said, uh, what are your plans in regards to class changes for Battle for Azeroth? Uh, many specs, Demonology, for example, uh, did not like the direction their spec took in Legion, and from what we heard at BlizzCon so far is that there will be few class changes. Okay, so we'll have, we'll have a lot more to share on this in the future as we begin to sort of ramp up our beta for Battle for Azeroth. But just in broad philosophical terms, I, I don't, a few class changes I don't think is an accurate description. Certainly fewer than in Legion. I think sure, Legion yeah. was the probably the expansion that changed the most about WoW classes in the history of World of Warcraft by a large amount. Mm. In, you know, literally, you know, tons and tons of specs had their entire rotations changed. Dozens of abilities removed, dozens of abilities added, hundreds, in fact, across the board. Yeah. We're not looking to do something on that level. Change is, is very costly and very disruptive, and it's jarring to come back and feel like something about your spec has fundamentally changed. That said, given the amount of change we did in Legion, it's inevitable that not all those experiments were successful. Right. And I think Demonology Warlock is one that we would ca classify as not a fully successful experiment. There's something cool about the fantasy of the master of demons summoning that has an army of demons at your command, and uses them to blow up your enemies. There's something less cool about the execution of significant ramp up time and a maintenance feel yeah. that actually doesn't make you feel all that empower empowered. It's more, you know, you're just trying to juggle a bunch of stuff and mm -hmm. worry about that. So, demonology, I would expect to see a pretty significant rework in the next expansion. Uh, Survival Hunter is another example there. Um, the, you know, where there are people, you know, it's awesome to offer the melee hunter possibility that's something we're still committed to but the execution of that fantasy mm. can use some work now beyond that there'll be a couple of other specs but across the board we're certainly looking at talents for everybody yeah, we're yeah, looking yeah. at you know whether it's dead talents that no one takes really sort of very binary uninteresting choices like the pure single target versus pure aoe option where you feel like you need to switch those back and forth between encounters otherwise you're not really effective or competitive with other people that's not interesting that's more just a, a hurdle that you have to clear um and also 
in the aftermath of the artifact weapons, we're certainly looking at what gaps are created by those abilities no longer being present and how we should best fill those gaps. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So it's kind of like, in terms of class changes in uh, in Battle for Azeroth, maybe it, maybe a good analogy would be sort of the um, uh, like Wrath of the Lich King to Cataclysm sort of transition there, where the systems were all relatively similar, and some classes got some pretty or some specs got some pretty heavy changes, but there wasn't like we're going to go through every single spec with a fine tooth comb and completely rework everything from the ground up. Um, yes. Minus the addition of three new abilities for everybody, and sure, minus yeah, yeah. removing twenty points of talents from everybody. Yeah, yeah. but yes, yeah. I guess. Yeah, I we, guess went, that was... we went from fifty-one tree, fifty-one yeah, point yeah, trees yeah. in Wrath to thirty-one point trees in Kata, and pick your spec at ten. And Man. yeah, it's... this game's been around a while. <laughs> we change classes a lot, and I totally get people who are yeah, yeah. frustrated by by that, and yeah. just wish we'd leave the damn class alone sometimes, <laughs> so you can just play the game. Uh, so speaking of leaving the class I don't, I don't that's, yeah, a, that's anyway. a bad transition anyway awful lawful said uh, with the return of raid buffs will we see classes gain raid utility back such as Re- retribution having hand of sacrifice um, I don't know about that specific example but you know certainly Rhett has hand of protection which is hmm. awesome uh, or blessing of protection really um, has, is, is, which is awesome utility very valuable those are the sorts of things we want to you know, continue to maintain and expand where it makes sense. And it's not just a raid thing, it's also dungeon utility, whether it's, you know, I think Shred of Concealment coming back to rogues in 7-1, and us seeing in the Mythic Dungeon Invitational and in Mythic Keystones on a regular basis, yeah. how awesome it is to have a rogue for that reason. I think the more you can look at your raid composition or your dungeon composition and be happy that there is an X present, because right, yeah. that means you have some benefit. It may not be a specific buff or a debuff, it could also just be utility. Having death grip, having someone who can death grip in your group when it's Sanguine Week is a really big deal. Having someone who can death grip Shadow Souls on Kill Jaden is super useful, or in any number of fights. Um, and that's not radio, you know, formal raid utility in the form of Hand of Sacrifice, but it's unique tool, tool sets that set specs and classes apart from each other, and that's a space we really want to explore a lot more. Okay, interesting. Yeah, like I, I can even think of little examples, like um, in uh, Court of Stars, if you have a, oh, yeah. a demon hunter for the for the end bit, that's yep. that's like obviously yeah. that's a very niche yeah, example. Yeah, demon hunter or but... protection paladin. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, that works as well. Uh, question from Isara Shanai, who says, "Are there any plans to build some artifact traits into spells come Battle for Azeroth, like mobile trank for resto druid?" So you kind of yeah. mentioned this a, yes. a second ago. But so yes, um, but it's n- not a one-size-fits-all approach. We're not just automatically porting everything forward. Sure. You know, some things may become baseline, some may be talents. Uh, you know, as players might have seen, players of BlizzCon who played Elemental Shaman in the demo, for example, probably noticed that Stormkeeper, the current artifact active, is an available talent in mm-hmm. the Elemental Shaman talent uh, tiers in Battle for Azeroth. Uh, this is uh, this isn't an official statement, I guess, because this decision hasn't been made. But mobile trank is actually something I would favor not carrying forward. I think that <laughs> it's a great quality of life boost. Of course, you're used to being able to move around. And I realized that for those of you who remember Symbiosis and had a pet resto shaman back in the day, you also could do that. Mm. Um, but trank is an incredibly powerful cooldown. There's a part of using it, I think, is actually that restriction of... Yeah, you have to pre-plan it to some extent. You have to plan when you're doing it. Resto Druids are already super mobile in every other aspect of their gameplay. Now, we obviously just trank maybe need to become even stronger in some cases where there's this drawback to it because there's some cases where there's heavy raid damage going out, but you actually wouldn't be able to safely trank without being able to move, potentially. Hmm. But strengths and weaknesses, I think, are a better place than talenting out of weaknesses such that right. there are no drawbacks and no interesting decisions. And, you know, I think that's one of the comparisons of Healing Tide Totem versus Trank, right? Healing Tide Totem, yeah, you, you, Shaman can run around and do whatever they want to do while it's down, but it probably should be weaker than Trank hmm. because Trank has the other restrictions of being an ongoing channel thing, and even more so if you can't move during it. Of course, all of what I said, who knows, we could end up rolling this in any way. Sure. But in just in term, from a full philosophical perspective, yeah. A lot of the quality of life improvements or things that remove drawbacks, specifically removing drawbacks to abilities, is one of the areas that we are most hesitant to 
to entrench as a permanent part of the class. I think yeah. they make for cool set bonuses, they make for cool traits, because you get to cheat a little bit, you get to break the rules. But once it's permanently that way, well, part of interesting gameplay in using that ability has now gone forever. Yeah, that makes sense. Like when the when the drawbacks aren't really substantial, then the strengths can't really be substantial either. It has to yeah. just still kind of again, even out. And we, we we want these abilities to be good, but I think it, it's again it's given the choice between removing weaknesses or improving strengths to offset those weaknesses, I think we tend to favor improving strengths as a way to make more interesting and diverse abilities. Okay. Uh, moving on, next question here comes from Enika Huntress, who asked, uh, what's going to happen with Hati for Beast Mastery Hunters? It would be sad to lose the skins, but also the extra pet with a story behind it, it just felt right for the spec. Yeah, I think Hati is very closely tied to Titan Strike. I don't think that's something that's going to be carried forward as part of BM in perpetuity. Uh, again, certainly for someone who didn't play Legion at all and comes back to Battle for Azeroth, it's odd to either require going back and getting this thing or having this mystery extra bonus pet. That said, there's something very cool about having multiple pets as part of the feel of Beastmaster, and one of the things that sets Beastmaster apart from other hunters both in terms of how you're playing and just visually when you see one. And so that's certainly something we could expand upon more. Okay. A uh, question from Akko, who asked, will we see updated Warlock animations by the end of Legion, or will it be around Battle for Azeroth? So we, we mentioned yeah. a while ago that we are working on updated yeah. animations for Warlocks. Uh, any idea on the time frame for when we can get yeah, those? Yeah, so I think, you know, improved animations, visuals, that's an ongoing process that we don't see ever really ending. Uh, Warlocks okay. are something we're working on. I think that will likely be around Battle for Azeroth at the launch of Battle for Azeroth in that pre-patch. Okay. Uh, question from Towering, who asked, with the new old zone, the new old zone leveling scale, uh, will you make older zones more relevant for the end game content, uh, like world quests or more time walking? So like, are we yeah. going to have uh, desolous world quests or something like that? No immediate plans to do that, at least not in 735. But having that tech in place certainly get, opens that door, gives us the potential to do it hmm. when it makes sense in the future. That could be cool. Uh, almost out of time, so I'm just going to keep moving through questions. Question from Ilko Land, who said, uh, Legion's Relics helped even out the massive power difference of getting or not getting a weapon drop. Will Battle for Azeroth go back to pre-Legion weapon drops, or will there be a new Relic-like mechanic? So kind of yeah. the idea of, I, I finally got my weapon to drop that's a big swing yeah. upward in power, or it hasn't dropped, I've been waiting for it. So the flip side is, I think... I've also heard feedback from a lot of folks that relics diluted the excitement of getting a weapon drop and getting a weapon upgrade. And so I think that's a, that's a bit of a double-edged sword, so to speak. Um, anyway. Uh, but yes, yeah, so I think the, the plan is to go back to weapon drops that drop in their entirety. But that said, compared to the old days, there's so many more sources of loot now. I think when people reminisce about frustrations around weapons, it was often looking at a raid tier and saying, well, there's two bosses in this entire tier that drop the two-hander that I need or drop the dagger that I need on my assassination rogue or the two daggers I need. And every week I only have this one chance and this one moment of frustration when it doesn't drop. Right. Nowadays, we have you know Mythic Keystone system. We have other opportunities to get those items. So there's a broader variety. And so it's more maybe you might want the perfect weapon that has the stats that you want on it but fewer people will be in a situation where they just can't get a dagger of item level X to help, you know, no matter what they do from any source. Okay. Uh, we've got time for one or two more. A uh, question from Zeron who asked, uh, what's going to happen to our beloved Underlight Angler come Battle for Azeroth? Uh, unlike the other artifacts, I think the, our current thinking is to carry the Underlight Angler forward. Um, our artifacts, you know, they, they, have, they have an important purpose ahead of us to serve, but it's not clear that a fishing artifact <laughs> falls in quite the same category when it comes to the story. So we'll, we'll see how that unfolds. Okay. Uh, question from Bimidi, who said, with the increase to the amount of characters per server limit, will we also see an increase in the character per account limit? Uh, so, yeah, we, we're planning to increase the number of characters per server as when allied races roll out. Hmm. And that's in case you're at the current max, you have 12 characters in your server, you want to make a Zandalari Troll, you want to make a Dark Iron Dwarf, we don't want you to have to delete one. Uh, so that is why we're doing that on that level. I think the, the 50 per account limit, um, there are, I think, far, that, that's less of an immediate concern, frankly. Uh, I'd be curious, you know, to hear from folks who 
have 50 characters that are actively used and mm. that you know couldn't be deleted if needed that's a very very high number i think that's more than pretty much anyone actively plays based on on our data and that i mean that number exists just that we need some database constraint so that we know that you know there's an upper limit to how much storage is required per individual player playing our game um and that's not a number we're currently planning on changing but open to feedback as to why there's you know a compelling reason to do so I'm sure there are people out there who saw the 50 character limit and took that as a challenge. I'm sure. I'm sure. Again, I'm sure, I'm sure <laughs> there are absolutely people who have 50 characters, but yeah, how many of those are the character that you made, who's level seven on your friend's server that you just made to say hi one day? Sure. Yeah. But you haven't played in three years. Like. It, uh, yeah. 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 I, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, all right. Well, that's uh, about all the time that we have for here today. Uh, so thank you very much for for joining us yeah, here in our. Our swanky new temporary studio. Well, it's not temporary studio. Yeah. It's temporary <laughs> temporary dressing. But uh, pleasure as always. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, reminder for everyone: the uh, World of Warcraft 13th anniversary event is actually going on right now. So be sure to check that out. Log in, do stuff. There's all sorts of fun little little goodies hiding around in there. Um, I've I've heard tales of some dragons that may be there, in need of. There killing. are some dragons. There's a lot of transmog that you haven't been able to get in quite some time. Mm. For those of you who are interested in such things. Yes. Awesome. Uh, so thanks again, everybody, and we will see you guys next time. Yeah. Until then. <laughs>